Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, and welcome back to the Nano Hub U course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher from Purdue. And we're in the middle of week three, which is on basic thermal properties. And today we're going to talk about optical phonon specific heat. And just to remind you what specific heat is, it's the, the derivative of the specific internal energy with respect to temperature. And the, the toughest part of, of evaluating something like this is the evaluation of the temperature der derivative of the distribution function, and that's shown at the bottom here. Again, we're going to focus on phonons today, so there's the chemical potential is zero, and that, that simplifies the expression quite a bit. Now what, we've, what we're going to talk about today is something called the Einstein model, which is an approximation that's similar to the Debye model, although quite a bit simpler. The Debye model, if you'll rec recall from the last lecture, assumed that the dispersion relation for the phonons was linear. We've drawn the dispersion relations from our one-dimensional atomic chain with a two-atom basis, and when we added that second uh, atom, we found that we get an extra branch, and that was called the optical branch. And this optical branch tends to be flatter than the acoustic branch, and so the Einstein approximation which when it was made, I, I believe it was made to be general, um, but it, it applies particularly well to this optical branch and not so much to the acoustic branch. Although in the high temperature limit, the, the Debye and the Einstein models for all branches converge to the same, the same value, and we'll see that a little bit later today. The most important metric here is the Einstein frequency, or, or equivalently the Einstein temperature that's defined. So if we're going to define a constant frequency, all of the phonons are oscillating at one frequency, regardless of their wavelength, um, that frequency is shown here as a flat dispersion curve, meaning it doesn't have any group velocity. So these optical phonons in this approximation cannot transport heat, they can only store it. And you might say, well, then what happens to it if it can't, if it can't go away? And the answer is that comes That'll come a little bit later in our scattering analysis where the optical phonons will have to scatter with other carriers and those will carry the heat away. One of the nice things about studying optical phonons is it, it gives us an, a chance to an, analyze an energy and specific heat in a different way. Most of the time we take these summations over K space and we convert them to integrals, sometimes integrals over frequency space by using the density of states. And here, we're going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to stay with the core, the, the summation form. And so the uh, extensive internal energy is listed at the top under this particular approximation. So the Einstein frequency is shown omega sub e. And we evaluate the distribution function also for that same energy or frequency omega sub e. And so the, the summation becomes much easier because these terms, you'll notice, None of the terms depend on the wave vector at all. It, they're just a const, they're constant frequency terms. And so that summation over k-space can be simplified. And that's what we show uh, as we move through this. If we take the temperature derivative to convert internal energy to specific heat, and then we normalize again by volume to make it specific, um, we find the expression at the bottom where now these summations, what we're doing for the k-space summation and the branch summation, that's the p-index, we're just summing uh, unity uh, over and over again. So the, the value of one, we're just summing those things. When we do that, you'll notice if I look at, if I sum over k-space, I'm just going to get the number of allowed modes. That was capital N in our nomenclature before. And if I divide that by length to the power d, that's the dimensionality, then that's going to give me the number of modes, which is equivalent to the number of primitive unit cells per unit volume. So that's my unit cell density, eta sub a. That's the first term in the last summation, or in the, uh, in the summation underneath CVE here. And then I multiply by all of these other terms, most of which are constant, except for the temperature dependence, because again, h bar omega is a constant. And what we can do lastly is we can make a substitution uh, or we, we can define a variable chi that is like a normalized Einstein energy. It's h bar omega e divided by kBT. So it has a temperature dependence built into it. 
when we introduce that into our summation term, then we get a fairly neat expression at the bottom where we have a summation over uh, a, a bunch of terms that end up being constants. Now, I w w there's one caveat I'll add, and that is I could define a different Einstein frequency for each branch. That's the summation over P. Um, and, and we'll do that. Uh, we'll we'll kind of keep it general, allowing for that possibility here in most of the analysis that we do. Now, the Einstein model for optical phonons is particularly good for very high temperatures. These would be temperatures that are substantially higher than the, even the uh, what is already a high temperature, that is the Einstein temperature is generally large because the optical frequencies are fairly high. But if we get to temperatures above that, uh, then we can evaluate this for very, very high temperatures. And in fact, that term with the chi's and the exponents of chi's, the limit of that as chi goes to zero, which would be the high temperature limit, if you look back at the definition that we just made, the limit of that whole term is one, and therefore the specific heat, the Einstein specific heat for high temperature uh, is just a sum over the unit cell density multiplied by Boltzmann's constant, and the sum is over the, the branches. Uh, and this is actually the same result that we had for the Debye model in the high temperature limit. We called it the law of Dulong and Petit, and we said it was three times eta times k because we were saying that there were three uh, branches. And we could do the same thing here for a three-dimensional problem. But if we had fewer dimensions or fewer branches, then, then you would just um, add the appropriate terms there. So that's the high temperature version of it. The, the lower temperature version where really the Einstein model doesn't work all that well um, is, is shown here. Uh, and so we see that in this low temperature region, I should say the Einstein model doesn't work very well for, um, for, for the uh, acoustic branches, which it was originally intended to do, at least in part. Uh, but this, the Debye model is here. And, and we'll notice, if you'll recall, for a three-dimensional material, at the very low temperature, so temperature much less than the normalized, uh, temperature much less than the normalizing factor, which is either the Debye temperature or the Einstein temperature, we had the T cube dependence. But then we talked about that Dulong and Petit asymptote, so the Debye model asymptotes to that, as does the Einstein model. And you'll also notice one other thing. For the Einstein model, uh, for very low temperatures, it's, it's really essentially zero. Well, that's why that that's because at very low temperatures the distribution function is essentially zero because the Einstein frequency is fairly high and and there's not enough thermal energy to populate those states until you get until you reach a certain point at which point you start to the Einstein model starts to grow so you can kind of think of this region where there's a the large difference for at low temperature between the Einstein and the Bi models that's where the um, that's actually where the, the, the optical phonons are essentially frozen out. They can't store thermal energy because they're not populated. The last thing I want to do today is to go back a little bit to, that, to the Debye model and talk about lower dimensions. For the Einstein model, it's pretty simple because we're just summing over, um, over different branches. So the number of branches is going to be proportional to the number of dimensions of the problem. And um, so the general model for what I call a, a lowercase d, uppercase d dimension, so that would be 1d or 2d or 3d, the general model looks like this. Uh, it's very nice to cast it in this, this first equation to cast the problem in terms of, of the density of state, so make it a frequency integral. And then the dimensionality of the problem is built into the d density of states. And we went through the differences of the density of states in, in the, the various dimensions. Um, and then the summation term will also have a different, you'll have a different number of summation terms, P, um, or summation indices, depending on the dimensionality. But if we plug this into the Debye model, for example, what we'll find is that the specific heat for the Debye model, that's the comma capital D, that's the, that's for the, that stands for Debye, will be proportional to, the first term is the dimensionality of the problem, that's one, two, or three. And then I'll have another term here that is uh, temperature raised to the power D, and at least at low temperature, that's the dominant term, and so that's why we get the T cubed dependence. So on the figure in the right, 
we see that the, the 3D result, that's the blue curve, has a T cubed dependence. You probably can't see that from your, just by eyeballing it, but, but that's what it is. It's a T cubed dependence. And then if I, if, when the temperature increases to about, oh, 20% or so of the Dubai temperature, then it starts to become fairly linear. And then when it gets to about uh, a value of the temperature is about half of the Dubai temperature, then it really starts to flatten out an asymptote toward the law of, of Dulong and Petit. Um, for 2D, that low temperature uh, exponent is 2. And so you see a little bit of curvature for, for the very, very low temperatures. And then it does more or less the same thing that the three-dimensional curve does. And then for one dimension, the exponent of temperature in that first term of the of the equation is one, and so you, you have a linear specific heat for low temperatures, which then proceeds to asymptote for higher temperatures. What this is telling you is that if you can if you have a material and you're not sure what the dimensionality is, you know, whether the phonons have enough whether the, the system is large enough to, to support phonons in multiple dimensions, um, if you had a, a way of measuring your specific heat, which is a fairly th easy thing to measure, um, but do it at very low temperatures, much, much below the Dubai temperature, let's say uh, at one or two percent of the Dubai temperature, and then vary the temperature a little bit from there. If you could, if you could extract from your experiment this exponential power, then you would know essentially what the effective dimensionality of your system is. And people did that uh, back in, in, you know, times before that it was easy to make low dimensional materials, they did notice something funny, for example, about graphite. So graphite is a, is a three dimensional material, but it's layered and it's, it's, uh, the interactions between the layers are fairly weak. And so graphite has a uh, temperature to the power two specific heat dependence, even in its bulk form, because, because the, the phonons are essentially confined to layers, to two dimensional layers. All right, well, that's it for today, and I will see you next time.